process of moving this um, event online, given the circumstances. I brought a cup of Oibos tea in order to make this a little more South African for me here in Melbourne. So uh, I would like to, to take the opportunity to report uh, on uh, two papers, uh, one that's already out in collaboration with Mauricio Romo and Emanuel Scheidecker, which came out in March, uh, and another one with my student David Erkinger, which is still in progress. Um, and what we are doing is we're using um, supersymmetric gauge theory, so um, to be more precise, um, two-dimensional gauge linear sigma model and um, fairly recent results from supersymmetric localization to study the stringy Kähler moduli space and sort of universal structures in the stringy Kähler moduli space. So this is the outline of my talk. Um, I will start off with an overview, which will take me quite a lot of time. This is sort of the executive summary of the talk. And the remaining time I will use to fill in the details, which will be to recall um, the gauge linear sigma models and the results from localization, in particular the hemisphere and the sphere partition function. Um, and then I will discuss in more detail the results we have found in our paper on how the general structures uh, of the hemisphere partition function evaluate in, evaluated in certain phases of the gauge linear sigma model look like. All right. So let me start uh, with setting the stage. Um, what I will discuss today is um, the string e Kähler moduli space. And in this talk, uh, I will confine myself to um, general setting of Calabria three folds uh, in a type two string theory um, with or without deep brains. And I also want to mention at the beginning that um, I will have a rather broad notion of what a Calabria threefold is. In particular, I will not make the assumption that it is uh, somehow uh, geometric, but I will view it a little more abstractly as a, uh, an example of a 2,2 superconformal field theory with central charge 9. So what I've tried to draw here is a cartoon of um, what the stringy Kähler moduli space looks like. So since we are um, looking at Calabi-Aus, um, what uh, we have here at every point in the moduli space is a superconformal field theory. Um, the point is that there, there are usually quantum corrections and at a generic point in the moduli space, we don't really know how this superconformal field theory is realized concretely. But um, if we go into certain limiting regions in the moduli space, then we know very well uh, what these superconformal field theories look like, at least in some regions. And the best studied examples are, of course, um, the large volume regions in the moduli space, where you indeed have some geometric description of your Calabi-Aur compactification. And uh, the conformal field theory is realized in terms of a non-linear sigma model with Calabi-Aur target. On the other hand, there are other limiting regions in the moduli space uh, which are not like that. And well-studied examples are, for instance, landra ginzburg orbifold regions, which can be somewhere else in the moduli space, and they are not really geometric in the sense of a nonlinear sigma model. And actually, the generic points in the moduli space are usually neither large volume nor landra ginzburg but are some kind of hybrids thereof. And those are not really well understood. And um, depending on which region you are, there are sort of boundaries where the properties of the theory change. So the Kähler moduli space is divided up into chambers. And actually you can cross between these chamber boundaries to go from one locus to another. And, one ex and usually something happens to the calabi so you don't even need to have the same calabi There can be some kind of topological transition taking place, and then you have more than one calabi sharing the same Kähler moduli space. Um, and for instance, you can go from the large volume region to a landau ginzburg region, and that would be the famous landau ginzburg calabi correspondence. And you can ask the questions, okay, how are the th theories in these chambers corresponding to these chambers related? Uh, and I guess the most general and also mostly conjectural statement is that certain categories, deep brain categories associated to certain limit calabi and limiting regions are equivalent. And what I want to do in this talk is to study uh, limiting regions in the Kähler moduli space which are not of the large volume type. And um, the physics tool I'm going to study um, this is, with is um, the gauge linear sigma model. So a 2D 2,2 supersymmetric uh, gauge theory. And um, in the context I'm using it, uh, the important fact is that the GLSM 
uh, provides a common UV description to all the CFTs uh, um, that you have um, uh, along the Kela moduli space. And the way that GLSM does it is um, that the chambers are realized, or that the physics in the chambers is realized as low energy configurations of the gauge cleaner signal model. And to see how this works, we have to note that um, being what it is, um, the gauge cleaner signal model comes with certain parameters, and in particular, it comes with Fi theta parameters. They're complex parameters, I denote them by T. Um, theta is the Fi parameter, theta is the theta angle. And um, they can actually identi be identified with coordinates on the Kähler moduli space. So by studying the gauge linear sigma model at different couplings, we can get access um, to um, the different regions in the moduli space we are interested in, and not necessarily the large volume regions. Um, and actually the GLSM, of course, when you study the different coupling, can behave differently at low energies, and that realizes these chamber structures I had on the picture of the previous page. So the upshot is we can use the gauge linear sigma model to map out the Kähler moduli space of a Calabia. Um, so this is um, actually uh, a rather old story. Um, what has been developed uh, more recently is um, that you can apply methods of supersymmetric localization, of course, also to the gauge linear sigma model. And what you get is exact uh, supersymmetric partition functions. And uh, I will show what they look like a bit later. What I want to stress now is that the partition function you get, you can evaluate them in different phases. And this way you can actually access different regions and compute or whatever these um, exact partition functions compute. And in particular, you can also compute quantum corrections with them because um, technically um, these partition functions will depend on the FI parameters and the parameter dependence on those will trans uh, translate into um, the world sheet instant on corrections you have in these theories. So it's possible to use the GLSM to compute quantum corrections in string compactification directly within the context of the supersymmetric gauge theory. All right, so my plan is now to study what these partition functions look like when we are not uh, in geometric settings. And for this, I also want to recall that uh, geometric regions in the modular space are, of course, very well understood and we know very well how to do computation because we have a lot of tools like toric geometry, topological string theory, mirror symmetry. We know how to compute enumerative invariants, which correspond to these instant on corrections and so on. And um, there are many reasons to believe that the structures that we see in geometry, they also hold at other loads in the modular space. And well, arguments in favor of this are, is of course the world sheet CFT, which does not really care whether there is a geometric space-time description um, of itself. Um, and also the results of supersymmetric localizations indicates that uh, whatever you compute in non-geometric phases cannot be as so much difference uh, to the geometric setting because um, you, um, you have to say it has, all of it has the same UV origin. So um, the question we asked ourselves in our papers was um, if we evaluate these partition functions in phase in, in, gener in generic phases of gauge linear sigma model, how do we interpret the results in the INR theory? And in order, and what we found is that when we do that, um, the results, the exact quantum exact results in the phases have actually the same structure in every phase. And in order to uncover these structures, you need something that is or objects that are available beyond geometric settings. And actually, if you look in the literature, there's quite, um, uh, there's quite a lot that you can find. So um, a lot of information, of course, you get from the world sheet CFT, from topological gravity and structures like TT star geometry. Um, also, when it comes to enumerative invariants, um, there is FJRW theory, Fun, Chavez, Ran, and Bitten, who developed um, tools for um, enumerative problems in, um, in theories that are not necessarily geometric. There are also certain mirror constructions which do not necessarily depend um, on, um, on geometric um, properties, um, like for instance, Giventhal's mirror construction, which will play a role here in this talk. And when you consider deep brains, of course, also categories are general enough um, in order to capture deep brains. Uh, beyond geometric settings. 
and we studied um, the hemisphere partition function and the sphere partition function and we find that certain ingredients uh, appear in every phase uh, when we evaluate these partition functions. And these are um, a certain choice of state space and the pairing, the i and the j function, which come from given tiles mirror construction, uh, which essentially encode the instanton corrections of the result. Then there is some topological uh, information in terms uh, given by the gamma class. And if we have deep brains, there's additional data from the deep brains. So let me in one slide uh, show you uh, what we found. Um, uh, so, uh, so uh, we conjecture that when we uh, evaluate the hemisphere partition function in any phase of a Palladiao gauge linear sigma model, uh, it always has this particular form. Um, we have a pairing, we have a churn character of a brain, we have the gamma class, and we have the i or the j function. I will say a little bit more about i versus j function later on. And we have shown this in geometry, where many results were already known, but also in Lando Ginsburg orbifold phases. And similarly, in the work in progress uh, with my student David, um, we tried to do the same thing for the sphere partition function. We also find a structure like this. The I function and this complex conjugate makes an appearance, but our results show that complex conjugation is actually a bit more complicated uh, than we expected, even though that the structures we see here can actually be found in the literature. So there's also again the gamma class and the grading operator acting on the state space making an appearance. And we actually tried this for um, hybrid type phases, which are Lander Ginsburg orbifold fibered over some base manifold. So this is the main results. That's actually all I wanted to say. Um, and the rest of the talk will be to fill in the details. We will proceed as follows. At first, I will recall what the left hand side of these equations are. And then I will move on uh, to discuss a bit what the objects on the right hand side are. OK, I apologize for the slightly technical slides. I will not um, introduce the full gauge linear sigma model, but only those uh, aspects of it that I will need to define the partition function. And that um, includes G, which is the gauge group, uh, a complex vector space where the scalar components of the chiral multiplets take values, uh, a corresponding matter representation, and at this point, actually, the Calabiao condition enters. So um, I, I will have a stronger restriction uh, on uh, the type of matter representation I can have, and that translates into the cancellation of the axial anomaly in the gauge linear sigma model. We have R symmetry, because it's a 2,2 theory, um, and I will need the vector R symmetry and the corresponding R charges of the fields I will call Ri. <clears throat> and um, furthermore, I will choose a maximal torus, uh, because in principle, this gauge group can also be non-abelian. Uh, and the corresponding Lie algebras. And then uh, the gauge charges of these chirals um, take values in the dual of the complexified Lie algebra of the maximal torus. Um, and I will denote them by Q. And the index I labels the field. And the index A labels um, the U1 inside the maximal torus. OK. Furthermore, I need to introduce the Fi theta parameters that I have mentioned before. And we also have st scalar components of the vector multiplet uh, of the gauge linear sigma model, which I will denote by sigma a. And you see here that there is actually a natural pairing between the t's and the sigmas, uh, because they take values in the duals of the corresponding Lie algebra. And um, I will actually discuss uh, exclusively compact Calabiaus, compact Calabia threefolds in my discussion. So in order to model that in the gauge linear sigma model, uh, I also have a non-zero superpotential, which is G invariant and has R charge 2. Um, and yeah, so different GLSMs will then correspond to different Calabios. And since I will talk about the hemisphere partition function, I will also introduce deep brains. So I will look at um, B-type deep brains, so certain BPS deep brains that break half of the supersymmetry. And they have a very nice uh, and very non-geometric description, actually, in the gauge linear sigma model in terms of matrix factorizations. So the data you need to describe uh, a GLSM D-brains is uh, a Champetten space, which is a set two graded module, um, and then a matrix factorization, which is an odd endomorphism on this space. And um, matrix factorization means that uh, you have a square matrix, which I denote by Q, which uh, which has entries in terms of these chiral fields phi, 
And the condition is that it squares to the superpotential I just introduced times the identity matrix on M. And because we have a gauge symmetry and we also have an R symmetry, these are also acting on, these symmetries are also acting on the D brains. So um, what we have is that the D brain should be gauge invariant. This is this condition here. And it defines, in addition to the matrix factorization, another matrix row um, that given a Q, you can just compute by solving this condition. And similarly, we also have um, R symmetry acting on the brain. And because I just told you that the superpotential has to have R charge too, by this condition here, the matrix, the matrix factorization or the matrix Q has to have R charge one. And this is, this, this is encoded in this condition. So the upshot of that is what we will need later on is um, we have the D brain data is a matrix factorization, but also these two matrices rho and R star, which encodes the R charges and the gauge charges of the D brain. Okay, and also here, different matrix factorizations correspond to different brains. So with that, I have all the ingredients um, to recall what the sphere partition function is. Um, so what we have here is, um, so this is when you, when you take the gauge linear sigma model, you put it on a sphere, you, and you exactly evaluate the, evaluate the path integral, it localizes onto this expression. And what we have here is a normalization constant a sum over an integer lattice, which comes from the fact that the gauge field um, on the sphere takes discrete values, uh, an integral um, over the maximum torus um, uh, of the GLSM, uh, parameterized by the sigma fields. If you have um, a non-abelian gauge group, you have this factor here where alpha are the positive roots. And this notation here with the, with the parentheses, this is this pairing between the Lie algebra and its dual that I have mentioned before. The information about the chiral matter fields enters here in this quotient of gamma functions and the Qs and the Rs are just the gauge and the R charges of the fields that I've introduced before. And furthermore, importantly, there is um, an Fi parameter theta and the theta angle appearing here. So this is what you get in the gauge linear sigma model. So if you now want to go a phase, to a phase, what you have to do is you have to evaluate this integral. And uh, this is a multidimensional complex contour integral. Gamma here is an integration contour that you have to choose in such a way that uh, all poles are in, avoided. And in the end, um, the choice of phase is given by the value of this theta and the theta. So large or positive or something like that. And depending on this value of theta here, you have to get a convergent result in the end. So you will have to close your integration contour in, in a certain way. And um, that will actually enclose, depending on the value of theta, different poles of these gamma functions here. And that's why the results, depending on the value of the Fi theta parameter, will be different. Uh, and that's how you get from the sphere partition function of the gauge linear sigma model to the result in the phases. And we actually know what the sphere partition function computes. Um, it is an, it's, it's a very interesting quantity in the context of string compactification. It's the exact Kähler potential on the Kähler moduli space. Um, so it can also be used, to, for instance, to extract chromophyton invariants uh, from these expressions. And the, sphere part the hemisphere partition function is actually very similar. Um, so you've seen these structures before. Here is again the Fi theta parameter, now with a little, with a somewhat easier um, dependence. And it, the, sphere, the hemisphere partition function is evaluated for a particular B-type D brain at the boundary, uh, inserted at the boundary of the hemisphere. And all the information of the D brain is hidden or is encoded in this factor B, which I call the brain factor. And if you have a matrix factorization characterizing the brain, and you automatically get these matrices R and rho um, encoding the gauge and R charges of the D brain, you can explicitly evaluate this brain factor and then go on and evaluate this contour integral in the phase of the gauge linear sigma model that you're interested in. And also this uh, computes some, in, some interesting quantity, namely the exact D brain central charge. So these are the definition uh, of the sphere and the hemisphere partition function. And the rest of the talk will now be dedicated to discussing of what these expressions look like in certain phases. And I will start with um, discussing the paper with Emanuel and Maurizio that came out in March where we in particular considered Landau-Ginsburg phases in this context. 
So I will start off with the hemisphere and uh, also briefly recall what the world sheet definition of a deep brain central charge is. So uh, from the world sheet perspective, um, the deep brain central charge is a disk amplitude. So you take a disk, um, you put a deep brain on the boundary of the disk, and then you stretch it into a cigar and you put, perform a topological twist. And then you insert um, an operator, either from the chiral or the antichiral ring, onto the tip of the cigar. And through the stretching and the twist, uh, this uh, state actually is projected onto the ground state. And the central charge is this bulk boundary two-point function. And uh, a comment that will also be important a bit later is that in order to get the central charge, you have to put either an A brain here and an element of the CC chiral ring at the tip, or you take a B brain um, at the boundary and an element of the AC chiral ring over here. So what we will um, discuss in this talk is the latter case, we will have B brains um, and AC operators. And for those uh, who are familiar with the topological string, I just want to comment that in the topological string language that would be considering B brains in the A model. So it's actually something that's not really captured by the topological string. And that's also what makes this partition function so interesting. Okay, so this is um, the world sheet picture. And uh, yes, let me go on uh, and recall this formula that you've already seen in the overview section uh, of the talk. Um, so I told you in principle what that is and how to compute it. So what we will do now is to look at the right hand side and give more details about what's written here. So what I will focus on from now on is Landau-Ginzburg orbifold phases. So like the simplest non-geometric phases that you can find in a gauge linear signal model. Um, and the plan is uh, to define the object on the right hand side of this equation um, for within the context of Landau Ginzburg overfold and then show that the results match with the hemisphere partition function also with mathematical results where many of these objects are actually already defined. All right, so I will now go step by step and try to define uh, what these properties are in a Landau Ginzburg overfold context. Good. Um, again, I will only introduce uh, what I need um, to define the properties we have here. So to get to a lander ginzburg orbifold, we have much like in the gauge linear sigma model, a superpotential uh, with uh, some, depending on some chiral fields, um, Xi. An orbifold group, uh, so now G is a discrete group and actually we will assume that it's um, a product of set D, so it will be abelian orbifolds in our context. Um, we have a matter representation uh, for, the, um, for the axis and I also introduced the left and right moving U U1R symmetry. Okay, so the first thing uh, I have to discuss is the state space and the pairing that enters this formula. So in the CFT, we have all these chiral rings, CC, AC, and so on. And in the Landau Ginzburg orbifold, they um, are realized in terms of twisted sectors, where the, these twisted sectors are labeled by elements of the orbifold group G. Uh, and I will choose certain basis elements. And actually by, make, by using this notation, I already have made a restriction um, that it's a technical restriction that you don't really need in the Landau Ginzburg orbifolds, but you will need it to define all the other quantities um, that uh, enter this formula I have stated. So I will now re restrict to so-called narrow sectors, um, which are one dimensional twisted sectors and the only, opt, the only um, element uh, in these uh, twisted sectors or, chi or chiral rings uh, is the identity operator or the vacuum. Um, so this is what's essentially the definition of a narrow sector um, and all the sectors which are not like that are referred to as broad. And the pairing we are going to use, or we're going to find in, the, in this formula, is a pairing on either the, you can define it either on the AC ring or the CC ring. Um, so uh, you choose a basis element of these twisted, narrow twisted sectors, and then this is the definition of the pairing. And I want to stress that this is not necessarily the pairing you want to, you would expect, because uh, I had the world sheet definition here where I said it, uh, this, hem, this uh, 
two-point function is actually a pairing between something that's uh, associated to the CC ring, namely a B brain, and something associated to the AC ring um, inserted at the tip. So one would expect a pairing between the CC and the AC ring, but we don't really uh, know how this works. But there is, of course, an isomorphism between these two rings uh, through spectral flow. Uh, so we should understand when we want to use this pairing, there has to be some non-trivial spectral flow somewhere. And this is actually also what we uh, observe in our work, and it's very consistent with the partition functions we compute. But in the end, uh, we will use this pairing in this formula. All right. Um, deep brain, B-type deep brains in Lambda Ginsburg Ovifold are actually easily explained because they are also matrix factorizations, and the data uh, is more or less the same uh, as what I had um, in. Uh, in, in the description of the B brains in the gauge linear sigma model. So again, we have a champ pattern space, we have a matrix factorization, and we have these two matrices representing now the orbifold group and the vector R symmetry on the boundary. And actually in 2004, Johannes Walcher told us how to compute the churn characters of um, a B brain or a matrix factorization in uh, lambda ginsburg orbifolds, and it's given in terms of a residue formula. And uh, I will not explain all the details about this formula, but you will see the matrix factorization enters, this um, orbifold representation enters, of course, a trace uh, over this champ pattern space enters, and um, we're inserting um, a bulk operator, so this is also a disk uh, two point a bulk boundary two-point function, we're inserting a bulk uh, operator corresponding to a state in the gamma twisted section. Um, so this formula is more general than the restriction I've made uh, previously to narrow sectors. So in the case that we were considering, actually this phi gamma here will be um, the identity operator. And I should also stress that the states and also these objects here naturally lives in the CC chiral ring. Okay, so for now, uh, going back to this formula, what we know now is the state space we want to use. We know what the pairing is we want to use and we have the churn character. So what I haven't told you yet is what the gamma class and the I function look like. And in order to define this, it's actually not enough um, to sit directly at the Lando Ginsburg point, but uh, what you have to do instead is you have to turn on marginal deformations away from this Lando Ginsburg point. And uh, we take quite a lot of effort uh, to um, encode the information about this deformation into a certain matrix that we call Q with rational entries. It's um, really a, quite a technical derivation um, from the Lando Ginsburg perspective um, to derive this matrix Q. And I will uh, refer you to the paper for details. Um, the point, so just to say that N is the number of chiral fields and H is the number of marginal deformations, again, restricted to these narrow sectors. And having this matrix, uh, we can then uh, give a formula for the gamma class. So in this context, the gamma class is an endomorphism on the state space that acts diagonally. And uh, these um, uh, eigenvalues, say, um, uh, associated to each of these narrow twisted sectors looks like this. So we have here this matrix Q entering that I just um, told you we derived. Um, and uh, in order to see the connection to the twisted sectors, that's actually not obvious. And we also take some time in the paper to see how this works. So I hope you take my word for it. But, so these are integers, um, positive integers. And you can actually associate each of these integers to a certain twisted sector. And there is some periodicity involved and actually the definition of this angle bracket here tells you that um, this object, uh, the, the results you have here is also periodic and in the end you have one expression for each uh, narrow twisted sector. So that's how we define the gamma class in this Lando Ginsburg context. And then finally, uh, we need the I function. So the I function uh, it can be expanded uh, in terms of this basis of the state space, um, again, restricted to these narrow sectors. And given um, this matrix Q that we compute, um, and furthermore, these QJs are the left R charges of the, of the chiral fields, we find these expressions here. So what we have here, these 
use. They are the local coordinates near the Lander Ginsburg point corresponding to the deformation parameters. Um, and then we have this quotient of gamma functions here. Where again, um, integers enter that uh, and uh, making some clever coordinate transformations, we can then associate certain uh, choice of these integers uh, to um, the twisted sectors. But that's quite technical, so I will not go into details. So um, now this is um, all we have, uh, but let me briefly mention a connection to the J function. So in principle, I, I, the formula I gave you um, for the hemisphere partition function or the central charge in the Lander Ginsburg uh, orbifold case included the I function, but actually in the paper we are writing the J function. So what is the connection? So uh, the J function and the I function are related by a transformation to flat coordinates. And the, the flat coordinates, these are not the coordinates U that come in here, but coordinates that I will call T. Unfortunately, this is a bit of an unfortunate choice because it's, not, it's also not the FI parameter of the GLSM. Um, and these correspond, these flat coordinates uh, can be identified with the deformation parameters of the marginal deformations in the, of the world sheet CFT. And there's actually a prescription in the Landry Ginsburg orbifold context uh, on how to um, get, uh, the, get, the, uh, get the definition of these flat coordinates. So you choose some components of the I function that correspond to AC states with a certain left and right R charge and another component which has, which has R charge zero, zero. And then this quotient depends, uh, determines the flat coordinates and the J function is then obtained as the quotients of the full I function by this component I zero. And those who know mirror symmetry will recognize this uh, definition of the flight coordinates actually as the mirror map, even though both the I and the J function should be interpreted as A model objects. All right. And so if you, if you were to extract, for instance, gomma Witten invariance uh, from these expressions, you would have to um, actually make this transformation to get the J function into the formula. Okay. So finally, to summarize what uh, we did in the paper, um, these uh, definitions of I functions and gamma class that I've shown you, um, they, uh, we, we got them more or less exclusively from the Lander Ginsburg data. Um, and then we checked uh, that these results are actually consistent with what is known from FGLW theory. Uh, so that gave an independent check of our results. And um, we also have some slight generalization of the FGLW results in the sense that we have um, models with more moduli and also more general gauge group. And uh, as promised, the hemisphere partition function actually reproduces the results uh, on the right-hand side of the equations when evaluated at the lansk ginsburg point. And the mechanism is that the GLSM gauge group is broken to the orbifold group. This matrix Q I introduced uh, is related to the matrix of gauge charges in, of the GLSM fields. Uh, and the GLSM brains um, is just a map from matrix factorizations to different matrix factorizations. And we tested this in examples uh, with up to four kilo moduli, including the computation of FGRW invariants that we did in this context. Okay, and in my remaining six minutes, I just want to give you a brief glimpse uh, on some upcoming work uh, with my student. So what we try to do is we try to do something similar for the sphere partition function. So here's, um, uh, the world sheet definition of the sphere partition function. Um, it's you take a sphere, um, or actually of the, of the kilo potential of MK, sorry. So you take the sphere, you stretch it, uh, you take, you perform, on one end you perform a topological twist, and on the other end you perform an anti-topological twist. Um, you glue them together and you get a pairing, a topological anti-topological pairing that defines you the kilo moduli, uh, the kilo potential on the kilo moduli space. And these states zero and zero power are in physics term related by CPT conjugation. And what we did is um, we uh, took a GLSM um, and looked at phases that are somewhat generic. So phases that are Landry Ginsburg orbifolds um, fibered over some base manifold B. So this would be called a hybrid phase. And this includes um, a special cases, Calabiao complete intersections and toric ambient spaces, and also Lander Ginsburg orbifolds. So all the cases we've covered for the hemisphere. Um, and what we see is that the sphere partition function in any of these phases um, 
evaluates to an expression like this. So we have again some sum over twisted sectors coming from this orbifold. We have an integral over the base manifold. We have a, a sign with the grading operator acting on the state space. We have a quotient of the gamma class um, and its conjugate where H here is um, a basis of H2 of the base manifold. And we have this norm of the I function squared. Uh, so th this is the structure you get when you evaluate the sphere partition function in those phases. And we interpret this again as a pairing between the I function and its dual. And again, the pairing here would be the topological pairing and uh, our results indicate that these additional gamma quotients are sort of the analog of the spectral flow we saw in the hemisphere. So in other words, that there is some complex conjugation of the I function reproduces this quotient of gamma classes. Okay, um, yeah, what we did is, um, yeah, I already said, special cases are Lando Ginsburg phases where the definition of uh, I function, J function pairing gamma class is just what I've given you. Uh, in geometric phases, um, um, in, for Calabi-R complete intersection, we have uh, the usual pairing on the even cohomology and I, J, I, J function gamma class and so on, you find actually in, in ma for many examples uh, in the literature. And yeah, as I said, our results suggest uh, the, this way of complex conjugation of the I function. And this is actually consistent with observations that have already been done in previous papers. Uh, once for um, uh, deep brains and also for leading order of the sphere partition function. Okay, and we did a lot of, or actually David did a lot of calculations uh, for 14 well-studied one-parameter examples of toric complete intersections. So there's always a geometric phase, which is a complete intersection in toric ambient space. And uh, another phase, because it's a one parameter model, which is either Lambda Ginsburg or hybrid, or some even more exotic hybrids that Aspen, Wall, and Plesser called pseudo hybrids. And we observed the structure in all the phases, even these pseudo hybrid ones, where it's a little more complicated, but also uh, along the line of the formula I've given you. And actually, I should also note that even in, in certain hybrid models uh, that are contained in this 14 examples, FGRW theory um, has been developed uh, and there are definitions of I function and gamma classes which match our results from the sphere partition function. And we also, um, for completeness, did a two parameter model and got new conjectural results for I function and gamma classes in multi parameter hybrid models. All right, and with that, my So I hope you hear me again. I obviously just got muted. All right, so let me conclude. I'm almost done anyway. In these um, uh, this two papers, one still to come out, uh, we conjectured universal expressions for the hemisphere and sphere partition function in phases of abelian H linear sigma models. And we have uh, collected a lot of evidence uh, for these universal expressions uh, for geometric Lando Ginsburg and hybrid phases. Uh, our results match with the mathematical results of FGRW theory and also mirror symmetry were available and we tested this for a lot of examples. And yeah, I guess this is only some, it's very example based and maybe only the tip of the iceberg. So I think there are quite a few open questions to look at, some more conceptual, uh, some uh, containing a lot of calculations. So for instance, um, we have this I function and the gamma class appearing and it would be very interesting to understand better how, for instance, the gamma class, uh, the significance of the gamma class in, in the world sheet theory. And um, also here, I've only talked about the Beeling H linear sigma models. So we're pretty confident that the results also generalize to the non-Abelian case. I think a, a, an interesting conceptual question that currently is also a hot topic in mathematics is to lift this uh, restriction to narrow sectors that we actually needed to find the, to define the I function and the gamma class. So there is some exciting new work ongoing in the mathematics uh, community. Uh, I think uh, with these techniques, we can actually say a lot more about these more generic uh, regions in the moduli space and hybrids, uh, in particular also in the context of deep brains, which has not been done yet. Also, we have looked at the sphere and the hemisphere, but there, is, uh, there are a lot of other results of supersymmetric localization in 2D theory, which one can look at. 
Uh, yeah, and in the end, finally, these formulas we've given are all conjectural, of course, and it would be very interesting to see mathematical proofs about that. And I think with that, my time is over now, and I thank you very much for your attention and the opportunity to present this work. Uh, thank you, Johanna, for this nice talk and being on time. Uh, um, are there questions? I do not see. Uh, oh, uh, we should. Uh, yeah, we should yeah, we thank should you. And okay. Now I have to mute you all. Correct. Because I just did it. So I unmute myself. Great. Now I unmute myself too. And are there any questions? Yes, uh, there is a question from Ed Witten. Ed, could you please ask? Uh, you are muted. Hello, Ed. Uh, can you please unmute yourself? I can, until a second. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. No, yeah, I, go I, ahead. I just was wondering if you could tell us what kind of mathematical results are there for you to compare to in the hybrid phases? Are there hybrid uh, yes. so the phases? results I'm aware of, I think the main result is, um, where is it? Sorry. Yeah. Uh, the, I think the, the main result I'm aware of is the PhD thesis of Emily Clater, who is a student of uh, Rams. Yeah. She defined the gamma class and uh, the i and the i function and the j function for the um, uh, hybrid phase of the bicubic in P five and for the uh, four quadrics in P7. So yes. for the hybrid phases associated with these geometric calavias, the, the results are known and we reproduce them. Yes. And there's yes. also some interesting work um, by Xiao, I think, um, on churn characters and deep brains in these hybrid phases. I see. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I don't see any other hands raised. Uh, any other questions or comments? Cyril? There is one. Yes, please, Ed, go ahead. No, Cyril Clausé, I see his hands is up. There oh, is another it, oh, now, yeah, it showed. Apologies, thank you. <laughs> you're, you're doing my job. <laughs> yes, uh, Cyril, could you please uh, yeah, unmute yourself and ask a question? Uh, please unmute yourself, Cyril. Okay. Yeah, no, it works. Thanks. Thank you, Jean, for a nice talk. Uh, can you say more about uh, what's the difficulty with the broad sectors, especially from the then from the localization, from looking uh, uh, at, at the at the formula explicitly? Yeah, I can. I can maybe say a little bit about what the difficulties for the broad sectors is in the GLSM. So it's. So in, from the GLSM perspective, it's, it's very hard uh, to see those moduli. For instance, if you are in, in a toric setting, these, uh, these moduli uh, would be moduli that are not inherited from the ambient space. So it's actually not from the GLSM point of view, it's not very clear uh, how to describe those. In, in the Lambda Ginsburg language, the broad sectors would correspond to those twisted sectors which do not just contain the, the vacuum state, uh, but also further states which you can characterize by monomials. And as far as I understand, there is the, the mathematical formalism of FGRW theory has not been developed um, for these broad sectors, but there is some interesting recent work by um, Faveria and Kim uh, where they make, uh, where, where they discuss the mathematical formulation of the GLSM, also including broad sectors. But I have to say, I haven't really digested this yet. Does this help you? Johanna, 
Hello. Hello, yes. Yes, uh, Cyril is asking if that helped you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, he says thank you. Okay. I see it in the chat. Okay. Any further? I don't see any other hands raised. Anyone else? If not, uh, we should uh, thank Johanna again for this very nice presentation. Thank you for coming. Um, the actual proof or any, you know, Thank you. understanding that this was the right answer or why Instagram is organized so nicely and, uh, was really far from us. I'm muting you all. <laughs> and uh, this would conclude the first uh, slot for the first talk. Uh, we should reconvene in about uh, 15 minutes or less. And um, 